Thank you for attending How to Be a Stylist, um, one of our part of our programming for young professionals, emerging professionals, and students. Tonight we have Leia Goldblatt, Ricardo Gutierrez, and Dolly Pratt joining us. Um, my name is Graham Wetzberger, and I'll be moderating tonight's session. I'm the incoming Vice President of Technology, the editor of For Conversations on Dress, and a national board member of Costume Society of America. So first I'd like to introduce Leia Goldblatt. Leia began her career in styling working for CBS and Paramount Pictures, um, where she was a personal stylist with Ricky Lake on The Ricky Lake Show and Montel Williams. Leia then took a job as in-house stylist for Derek Lamb, and I know she has a great story about that. And then her love of jewelry led her to begin designing bespoke diamond pieces. And <laughs> Leia currently works um, as the director of sales for White Pine Diamonds where she oversees the jewelry and luxury handbags category. Um, thanks for being with us today, Leia. Um, thanks for having me. Just to start off, can you tell us how you got into the crazy world of styling? It's actually a very funny story. Um, I was, I just graduated from college and I was in the Bloomingdale's training program during Christmas and they put me in the toy section. Okay, so. Ooh, yeah, okay. I, okay, it's a, it's a bittersweet story. My dad passed away, I was on bereavement group, bereavement leave, I went, took a walk through the park and in the middle of the park, there was a trailer there and they were in the middle of doing a casting a movie. And I was like, maybe I could do that. And I knocked on the door and this big fat guy comes out and he goes, how can I help you? I said, I don't know. I said, but I think maybe I want to be a stylist. And it was like, I just, I, I don't know how I got this nerve to just have this conversation with him, but it was like the beginning of the rest of my life. And he goes, kid, could you go take this picture and go to Gucci and here's my credit card. And he wrote a note on the credit card that I was able to use his credit card and get a pair of Gucci shoe, get a couple pairs of shoes. She only wants Gucci. I come back, size 12. I give it to the guy. I'm like, what woman is wearing a size 12? Meanwhile, it was Rude Harvey Hall. Weinstein. Okay, yeah. Ball. It was Har <laughs> Harvey Weinstein asked me to go get the shoes for Julia Roberts. Oh my so God, I get him amazing. the shoes. He, I get him the shoes. He said, gives me 50 bucks and sends me on my way. I'm like, that was so stupid easy. So after that, I decided how much I really hated my job at Bloomingdale's, and then I was creating a, a path for myself, and the Montel Williams show was coming to New York, and I barged in there with a shopping bags and rolling racks filled with clothes, and you know, I figured I'd dress the part, you get the part, and I went in, I wooed him over, and I then I worked for him for 10 years, Ricky Lake for 10 years, and um, it was a lot of fun. Montel, um, I was considered for an Emmy Award for costume design back then and i was up against the muppets so i lost but it was yeah, nice well. to be considered amongst those greatness um and then from there i ended up you know doing some other things and seeing if i like personal shopping and this and that but i ended up really liking styling and i stayed true to myself i did a couple of uh consulting things i did samantha who with jennifer esposito Donnie Deutsch, The Big Idea, Jim Cramer. So I've, I've done a bunch. Um, and then one day I decided to just, you know, find something else that would interest me because um, I, I just I just wanted to see what other hat I could wear. And I ended up working with Derek Lamb and helping him with all of his, um, you know, uh, sh uh, fashion shows. Um, and it was great because you got to work with Anna Wintour and all these fabulous editors. And, you know, you got to see it firsthand of really how diva-ish these people can be and it's great and it's definitely you know like it's it's, it's, a, it's a train wreck but it's awesome it's a very well-dressed train wreck um, yeah very then, good very good and then from there i ended up with the real real um i was doing their business development for vendor for jewelry and handbags for years um i resigned and i came over to gemma from white pine and I just uh, brought on a nice team of eight people and uh, have salespeople all over the country and we're procuring inventory and handbags and jewelry and it's been fabulous. And it's actually crossing me again with my stylist because they're all bringing me back 
the inventory of where they were shopping and who they shopped for. Now they're bringing it all back to me and they, a, the stylists are getting paid for it and their um, clients are getting, you know, liquidated assets. So it's, it's amazing. So, and I really love it. I always have styling in my blood. Um, and uh, my daughter works with me and told me that I'm the best dressed person in the office. So that made me feel good considering your always, kids never always. think you're, right? considering your kids never think you're that like you're, you're cool or you dress well. So that's where I am today. And that's I love awesome. every minute of it. And it was a great journey. Yeah, we were talking a couple of weeks back with Larry McQueen um, of the Hollywood Costume Institute. And there was a, a big discourse about, you know, costumes being made or purchased for one role and then kind of just getting relegated to the background. So it's really awesome that stylists are now can can commodify these purchases and resell them and move them on and, and, and keep them being loved instead of them sitting and getting dusty on a rack for decades before they're, you know, appreciated again. No, it's actually great because when stylists do that, they actually get that money allocated back into their budgets. So it's a win for everybody. And it's yeah, being, that makes so much sense. Yeah. I didn't even think about that. But yeah, if they have, you know, what, like 20K an episode or something, if they're getting 10,000 back, that just builds exponentially. Oh, it's great. It's great. So let's take a look at a couple of um, images and slides from your uh, early career. Here we have some pictures of Ricky Lake and you and I had this discussion prior to this is like you really cannot find high resolution pictures from TV in the 90s. So if our audience <laughs> is looking and wondering if these images are a little blurry, they are a little blurry. But um, <laughs> right. So what was like what did you and Ricky like create and define as her her iconic wardrobe? Okay, so Ricky really liked monotone looks. She did not like prints, um, and I'll tell you that because her window was fluctuated. So the print, and the print wasn't great on TV because it morayed, it moved, it, it wasn't flattering. So a more tapered look and a more monotone look gave her more length on camera. So we used to use, we did that most of the time. She loved yeah, black and navy. Like a wide shoulder, and then even a very narrow hip down to the knee. So kind of that V. That's exactly what we did. Very contoured, had, you know, always had a tapered waist. Um, we never did long dresses on her because it only it only just made, made her look a little wider. So there was it was not flattering. So everything was very, very important on how it's going to look, you know, on camera. Forget what it's going to look like on her. And then to smooth her out, to smooth out a woman, of course, you have to put spanks on because clothing looks great and it drapes better with, you know, garments underneath and she was very very hesitant to do it and she's like I'm not doing that I'm like you are <laughs> and you, you need are. to be the dictator okay and they need to be your you know audience and they need to listen to what you have to say and you have to put a firm foot down and you have to you have to use your voice to get to portray with fashion that you want to get you know on their bodies and why you and why you want it so, so that's really um, that was great a little challenging that was really yeah, challenging. You have to tell them because they're the client, you're the professional. You need to tell them what they need, and it's really the why. The why is so important. It's it, extremely important, and you have to get them comfortable to understanding why. And once, and so what I did was to make her understand why. Is we used to take Polaroids back then. Mm. So, and she would see herself with it and without it, and then she was like, "I'm wearing it." So you once go. you, Proofs and it's not pudding. just that, you know, or even somebody who weighs twenty. Right, exactly. And even someone who weighs, you know, 100 pounds still needs to wear that because it just makes the clothing drape as opposed to sticking to the skin and sticking to the body. It's really an important um, component to getting a lady dressed. So sure. that that was our challenge. And then we also had very little um, accessories, which was very important to her. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Keep it clean. Um, so, you know, I know when I would stay home sick from school, Montel was certainly on the daytime watch list. And I remember him going from this like power suit to like the Nehru collar and vest to like the streamlined black turtleneck. How did that style evolve and why? Okay, so, uh, okay and why? So when I first met Montel, he had, he, first of all, he's very colorblind. So he had all these suits, they were exactly the same and they were in a very 
very slight ombre. Like it almost looked like one color. So I, and he thought they were 10 different colors. So yeah. I said, all right, we'll, we'll put him in the suits. And he liked them skin tight because he had a, he still does. He's in very, very good shape. So I was trying to get him out of that. And not only was I trying to get him out, out of that, but we were with Viacom and Viacom would have my ear every day and say, get rid of the suits, find something for him. So I said to him, Montelli, we need to give you a shtick. We need to make you different on air than anyone else. We got to get rid of the suits. So I said, I have an idea. So I put him in with vests and the Nehru collars. And I said, let's wear the vests. They're tight. They'll see your arms. So here I am like complimenting him on his physique. And he was loving every minute of it. Love the vests. So we gave him this shtick. Um, so from there, then, you know, styles were evolving again. And he, I gave him a mock neck to wear under a single breasted sport jacket. He loved the way his body looked in it and he trusted me. So now he trusts me because I'm giving him things that make him feel more confident and his body is pronounced. That's that really what it's about, right? Just, Making your client feel confident. Confident and giving them that in, image. So it's more, so now you're, now you become a, from a stylist, now you become an image consultant because you got to create an on-air image for them if they're a host. So, and you want to set them apart from anybody else. So then I put him in um, these, these tight knits and he loved it. And, um, and, you know, it was, it was definitely a lot of fun dressing him because he got into it. You know, Ricky got dressed as if it was a chore. I sent Ricky to an event one night. She was wearing this gorgeous Prada dress, these amazing Giuseppe shoes. And back then the shoes were expensive and Ricky's feet hurt her that she threw them in a garbage pill. Yeah, because <laughs> and I was I like, you did what? Expensive <laughs> these days. Yeah. She's like, I'm not wearing these these shoes. I'm not wearing these. These shoes hurt. Um, let's touch really briefly at your time at Derek Lamb. We are peaking a lot, but <laughs> I need to wrap this up. Um, sure. So these are just so, four looks that I chose from your tenure at Lamb, just showing like a really diverse uh, aesthetic, or not as diverse aesthetic, but just a lot of styling in these pieces. Right. So he really liked texture. And he really, he happened to really like monotone, but we were trying to move away from that. Um, so that's, that was just his, his look. And, you know, he, he, he has a huge hand on what goes on that runway. So he really wanted to stay true to what he believed in. So it was, it was really keeping his looks very Derek, very minimalist, but very chic. And he yeah, also has great draping factors. Yeah, his draping yeah, on no, his clothing I mean, is amazing. Yeah, yeah, especially that, I mean, the piece, the resort piece, where it's just a little bit of jersey, silk jersey, it's draped so beautifully, it gives so much shape to what would, which, which really is a very boxy garment. Um, lastly, here's this video we're gonna play of your current, some of your current collections at Gemma by White Pine Diamonds. Some stunning handbags, this little Chanel vanity case, which includes four miniature bags. Necklaces. Nice bright orange turkin. <laughs> yeah, yeah, bag necklaces. That's right. You can wear them crossbody accessories. So this is what you're doing now. You're working with stylists and personal shoppers and and high net worth individuals and um, aggregating uh, beautiful products. Yes, gorgeous. Run all these pieces are mostly you know these pieces were runway pieces. You know, limited editions. Yeah, that's yours. So, artist collaboration. It's very cool. Yes. Oops. It was. It's been. It's been fun, and it's great to see these pieces in person. You know, because sometimes you don't. They're one of a kind, and you don't even get to see them anymore. You know, once right. they're gone, exactly. they're gone. Yeah, they're totally so, treasures. Yeah, it's it's been a lot of fun. Yeah, thank you so much for this introduction. We're gonna move on to Ricardo. So, I'm sure. uh, Ricardo, okay. thank you for being here. How Thank are you, you so much? Doing great. Uh, Wonderful to be here with you. I mentioned earlier that our outfits are kind of matching, which is wonderful. <laughs> I'm glad, you know, glad I still have We're it. We're besties now. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so with more than 30 years of experience in the fashion industry, Ricardo Mario Gutierrez is passionate about the pursuit of beauty in art and life. With an education in fashion design and an early career as a national leader for MAC Cosmetics and Versace Cosmetics, and later as a photographer, Ricardo has worked with major fashion personalities, brands, and art directors. Gutierrez now produces fashion shows with major retailers and nonprofits for fundraisers and owns R Models Agency, located in San Antonio, Texas, with, I believe, a soon to come location in Dallas. Is that right? That's right. We, awesome. uh, 
Well, the way it started was um, I graduated from college. I went to Europe and there I needed a job and I started working with a makeup artist. And so my career changed and I became a makeup artist, um, was in Europe for about three years, um, came back to New York City and I started working for Mac Cosmetics and um, was in about a year there and uh, I was chosen to be their first American technical trainer. And so I worked with uh, Frank Toskin and Frank Angelo at, the, at that time. Um, they still own the company. And so we were real pioneers in the industry. If you remember what Mac was like, everybody was tearing down the door to get their you know, spice lip liner and, um, you know, just, it was craziness there. And RuPaul actually was our first, um, Viva who's Glamour. that girl? I know, it was so I amazing. Mean, I was going to say the only time I ever worked for Mac was the cater waiter at the Viva Glam <laughs> party with RuPaul okay. and Linda Evangelista and Miss Universe and Missy Elliott. And I mean, that was for getting paid two hundred dollars to clean up spilt alcohol, that was the best time of my life. Oh my gosh! Well, you're probably the most beautiful guy there too, because they oh, always hired man. very handsome oh, and now beautiful. They sure did, and I felt so terrible next to all of these hunks. <laughs> well, I remember when we launched Who's That Girl, and nobody knew who it was going to be. Of course, it was a secret. We were at Henry Bendel's launching it, and this limousine. Uh, parks right in front of Henry Bendel's and the door opens and this really just long leg comes out of the limousine. Everybody's like, who is this? And then Rue Paul just appears. And it was just, it was so dynamic. I mean, Frank Tosk oh. and Frank Angel really knew how to, you know, launch uh, new products and they were just brilliant at what they did. So I was there for several years, um, five years actually. And one day uh, someone walked up to me and said, you need to come to this, um, a job interview and I said gosh I'm so happy here you know I can't, can't even imagine well I turned the card around and it was for Versace so of course I made an appointment and uh, after about I don't know how many gosh 10 interviews they welcomed me into the family and said welcome to Versace we'd like you to launch uh, the makeup line for us as director of training and national makeup artists in the United States and so I I just did just that and got a real um, crazy roller coaster of business all at one time. And so we did all the shows in Milano and then I would come back and do a tour around the United States, uh, mostly in Neiman Marcus. So um, every Neiman Marcus, I even opened up the Hawaii Neiman Marcus and um, had a wonderful time with them. Uh, right about four years into it, uh, my parents, were elderly, getting sick, and so I decided to move back to Texas and uh, move back to San Antonio. Still was working for Donatella Versace at that time, and so she was said, Ricardo, you can live anywhere you want as long as we can have you where we need you, and so I would travel from San Antonio. Anyway, it started getting a little difficult, but um, uh, stayed with them for another year and a half, and about that time, uh, my mom passed away, and I was thinking, what can I do to you know, have some therapy. And so I picked up a camera knowing that I'd been standing by a photographer sure. for so many years as a makeup artist, it just made sense. And I remember how they, you know, what lighting they used and, you know, they were so inspirational. Some of the best photographers really in the world that I worked with when we were at Versace and even for Neiman Marcus, we did the book all the time. So it was just really thrilling to, to pick up a camera myself and start shooting. And um, that's about the time I realized I like hiding behind a camera instead of being in front of the camera. <laughs> sure, so, sure. Yeah, and so anyway, I started shooting and uh, I sort of traveled between San Antonio and New York City. And uh, my clients would say like, well, uh, where do we get a model? What, you know, how can we find a model? And I said, you know, I just worked with this model. She was really amazing. And, uh, and it just turned into, it just naturally grew into an agency. I didn't know much about it, but we're, you know, 12 years into it and it's called Our Models Agency and uh, the location here in San Antonio has been doing very well. And so with the pandemic, um, I was joking around with a friend of mine that is also in the industry and I said, hey, would you ever think about moving to Dallas? And he said, I would love to move to Dallas. 
And uh, so I said, many so people have been moving to Dallas in the past year. Is moving to Dallas. He'll be our booker and manager in Dallas. And so that's kind of how it began. And so, uh, so we're not on the, on the uh, topic of styling at all, but I want to know, like, as the owner of a modeling management company, do you see, like, how do you view your relationship with your talent, if you will? Just like a couple of, I don't know, coach, mentor, director, boss, manager, it's, like. It's really everything. I call them my kids, actually. And, yeah. you know, I have 25 kids that go, whoosh, all in different directions and it's really hard to maintain them and i always say that's my hardest job because as a makeup yeah. artist it's just me i know what i can do as a photographer it's just me i know what i can do but 25 you know 16 to 25 year old kids just going in different directions and i we're really careful about how they feel what they're doing what their experience is i want to make sure that they're mentally good about where they are uh, we take really good care of them, but it is a hard yeah, job. Yeah, that's awesome, because we do hear a lot of, you know, like no one ever goes out of the way to say the good things, right? So we do hear a lot of really bad and tragic stories about people, uh, about models in this really yeah. cutthroat uh, world, yeah. So let's take a it look at some of your photography work. Okay. Hold for the applause. Um, all right, so I chose these three pictures out of uh, something you had sent me. Uh, just, I mean, they're full of whimsy. They have great shadow and and great um, uh, cropping. Yeah. Um, what can you tell me about these pieces? Well, first of all, color is really important to me. As you know, you can see, I'm a makeup artist, so you know, color and face is really important. I think there's a lot of photographers that maybe start off as a makeup artist and they go into photography so how oh, that's interesting for us, it's, you know it has a lot of again texture and color and, and whimsical i think is a good way of doing it i happened to be driving on the highway and i saw this circus and i immediately turned around and came home and found that dress and called the model and said we got to get out there today right now before they go away and we shot that piece with the circus and awesome. you know so i was so happy with it uh, you you don't get those moments all the time, you know. Um, the last girl is her name is Sally, and and she is a beautiful girl that lives um, also in San Antonio, but um, she's never shot before. She's extremely shy, and so um, you can kind of tell her, by the bangs, right, and like that little just like hint of a smile. I mean, she was really hiding, which was fine with me as a photographer. I'm okay with people hiding. We just need to capture something that is engaging. And the dress kind of set it all for her. Very anyway. like John Peter Rossi looking trapeze. Like again, like if you're shy and kind of self self conscious, like a trapeze dress like this, it's like it, it's so fitting. But like you think you really it brought has out so her much beauty. expression. And so you know, with someone that is that shy, if you can find something to me anyway, and my thought was if we can find something that could really move a lot, it would make that interesting enough. But yeah. I love the way it's, it's like what Leia was talking about about building confidence in your subject and your in your clients. I think it's important to you know, give them the confidence, all the confidence that we can give them. I mean, that's what styling is, right? Makeup does it, hair does it, uh, clothing does it. Um, you know, today you're talking to two award-winning stylists. I mean, they really know what they're doing. I, on one hand, you know, I'm about color and artistic view and, you know, what can I do to bring out the best of these models? Um, but they, as stylists, they know how to really dress someone. So they could probably look at, I've worked with many stylists, they can look at your body and say, I think this is what you should wear today. And listening to Leah talk about Montel was, you know, such a true story, right? They have to have that confidence For in sure. you. And then it just, gosh, that style just makes you and you're recognizable from then on. So, yeah, you know, styling absolutely. is so important. Um, based off your beauty background, I wanted to select this piece. It's, I mean, it's so upfront and close, but it doesn't look really over air, or, you know, over touched. Um, it doesn't uh, look face tuned mm -hmm. or airbrushed. It looks just so natural. And when I worked briefly as a stylist, um, it was always like, <laughs> you know, the photographers asked to make them look as great as you can, so I can spend the least amount of money in retouching. <laughs> well, also a lot of time goes into retouching. So it could, you know, yeah. you can shoot one full day, but you're going to have a whole entire week of, you know, Photoshop 
So it, it gets exhausting. I, actually, this one doesn't have barely any Photoshopping. I think maybe a little bit on the lip, but um, it was Versace uh, makeup at this point. We were just playing around having some fun this day. And I mean, she's a terrific model with a great face. The one thing I always remembered when I was a makeup artist, when I was working with other photographers, they always were very adamant about lashes being very separated because photoshopping lashes are, is really difficult. So, you know, that was the one thing that I really paid attention to. And that Versace lip to me was, you know, kind of said it all. You didn't need much more. No, absolutely. And then this is the last piece that I picked. So I met this guy, um, he was an international student at Trinity University, and they hired me to, um, to photograph all the students from around the world that they had attending the, the university. And he just stood out to me. He had so much personality. He was so big. That yeah, the eyes when I are powerful. Him, he's very powerful. And um, we found out that he's from Africa. I asked him, you know, would it be cool if I painted your face? And he said, I would love it. Let's do it. And so I painted his face. Uh, we put him in a Versace um, suit. Uh, I think that might be a, a Gucci tie. And I found this beautiful but, pendant. Uh, sorry, I was going to say the tie is everything for me. Yeah. <laughs> well, it was that one that one season when they did those flat ties and it, you know, hooks in the back. It's it's so yeah, beautiful. Yeah, yeah. And then the little pendant I found at a um, at an antique store. And, awesome. you know, needless to say, like, I wanted him so big that I thought to myself, like, how can we, and he was a dancer. He, he did this beautiful oh, African wow. dance. So I knew he can jump high. And so I said, well, I have this place in it mind. It does look like he's floating in the clouds. Well, he's jumping. He jumped oh, for wow. two hours. Oh my God. Really, really high. So I was, I was laying on the top of the roof of my car and he would just jump and I would try to capture it as soon as he would jump up, you know? Um, but we just That's got this amazing. really powerful image. Yeah, and to be clear, like I have not seen the image of him full body jumping. This is the only crop that I've seen, but like the right. composure and how just, you know, direct his stare is, it that's phenomenal. Ricardo, uh, he thank was, you so much. We will touch base you. very shortly. I'm going to move on to um, Miss Dolly Pratt now. So Dolly Pratt is a bi-coastal stylist having moved from New York to LA and then back to New York. <laughs> a versatile and upper creative, Pratt has is just at ease of creating eye-catching editorial looks as she is in styling advertising campaigns. Floods of natural light and outdoor settings have become a trademark uh, in her style from this, for, excuse me, for this Colorado <laughs> native. Yeah. Dolly works with brands she believes in, such as Eleven Honore, Bare Minerals, Benefit Cosmetics, and Vans. In addition, Pratt works with celebrity clients, including Ross Butler, Gavin Leatherwood, Cal Penn, and Ray Romano, among many, many others. But I do think it's fascinating that in your celebrity styling, you've really focused on the male niche. Yeah, it's. I think it's. Um, I love menswear. I. I obviously love like the structure of it. I think that there's so much to like play in it. And I like love my clients. Like there's nothing more than like making them feel really confident, making them feel really happy. So it just totally. also my mentors were all like in menswear. So like when I do oh, see really? women, yeah, I just like didn't. I'm like, oh my god, shoes and bags and jewelry. Ah, like you know. So <laughs> um, I think I had really incredible mentors, and I just really loved. I just that that portion of it, and I just kind of like expanded more into it so yeah so i'm just gonna jump right in because the first picture that we selected is shoes and well it's mainly bags but um oh, yeah I, I mean like my origin story is like just silly it's like i'm like you can ask me all the questions but i feel like well i mean i i think i particularly know a bit of your origin story you and i went to college together and we both graduated in fashion design. And then you went, you moved to LA to design surfwear for Roxy. And then I and was like, taking my clothes to Bali. I want that job. I was like, well, I'm designing <laughs> all of it. And someone's going to Bali with my bathing suits and sweatshirts. <laughs> I was like, that's not fair. So that's just how I kind I of- I want the trip. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so this is a travel, a travel campaign, right? 
This was for Sheraton Hotels. They were rebranding. And their clock the globe trotter luggage. Yeah, and so this is actually a Sheraton Hotel employee, and um, we like, found this hat at a costume house. We had to like kind of recreate their whole um, look because they were rebranding their uniforms as well. So, um, and we shot this. Yeah, on uh, it was my first really big travel campaign, and with this photographer, Eric Almas, that I still work with to this day, and he's incredibly talented. And he actually photoshopped, I mean, I, I don't know if I should tell the backstory, but it's a Tell beautiful. the backstory. So actually these are like, it's photoshopped. This is like, the, the employee is actually carrying all the bags, but he's on a fake horse. And then separately <laughs> shot someone else on the real horse, and then they, that they like placed them together. Was so. the sh was the horse on location, like in yeah. this field, or was the field a third thing too? No, but everything is real about this. It's just different images placed on top it's of a each different other. rider. Yeah. Yeah. So I was gonna say, you know, they say never work with children or animals. So I guess we actually didn't ha even have to work with the animal. Yeah, you do have to work with animals for sure. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> This was another oh, yeah. image that I just found super striking. This, I mean, to me, this looks like it's shot in LA. I mean, please uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, just this like fun. saturated light and the, the marble and. Yeah. And this is Precious Lee before she is now Precious Lee. I think, you know, everyone's seen her on the Versace runways. Um, I really love her voice. I think she's an incredible woman. Um, and this was my first time working with her. and everybody was like oh my gosh we haven't worked with her we had a two-hour fitting before we started shooting and this was actually shot with our friend um julian ungano and thomas agrodemus and our friends from college and so it was like a really proud moment to like have this like beautiful iconic woman shot in this high fashion which 11 on array at that time was like the first like full totally fashion. they were the only people in the game yeah. And we were providing so, designer fashion and women's exactly. sizes. This was like one of my like aha moments of like, wow, like this is just such a cool moment in my career for sure. And I love Precious. I think this was, yeah. And now this piece really, or this picture image really stood out to me because of like the depth of field. It looks just like a, a snapshot, like a street style picture just shot um, well, everyone's just going about their business. I mean, this woman in the far left, she looks like she's like leaving her shift as a nurse or a caregiver <laughs> or something, you know, and, and, and everyone has such unique personalities, but they are all super unique. This one in this one gentleman, second from the left looks like he's in uniform. The two people yeah. up front, of course, are like fashion. Walk us through this piece. Well, so this is like full circle. So I started designing for Quicksilver and then, you know, I wanted, this is shot in Cuba actually oh beautiful um, and so we flew down to cuba for ruka and um this was their kind of um i think oh, i forget the line that it's called but it was like a men's women's like i can't think of it but anyway, non gender it's conforming yeah and it was lovely and so uh, this was in the streets of cuba super renegade like we were not really allowed to be there so it was just like run and gun like dress them out of the back of a car and um both of these models are cuban and we barely could like communicate with them but because i don't speak spanish which i wish i did but it was an incredible experience and shoot and bring wrinkle release with you if you're ever on travel jobs <laughs> one note very good um, good to know yeah but yeah that was that moment um well so like i said a little bit about how you got into menswear but celebrity styling that must take a lot of like creed and uh i would say i think it is it's definitely an industry that it i assisted for seven years um oh wow and people. how much of that was unpaid um actually uh it's a lot of no they i always was paid i always have i had okay. good people maybe like one or two people not my mentors like kind of forgot to pay you because they just you know uh. things yeah. But mm -hmm. I, I, I really like I interned when I was so after I like quit my job at Quicksilver, I interned when I was 26. So that was tough. I had to live with my grandma 
for a while and like you know she was like when are you gonna move out and it wasn't until like an old navy commercial that like i made enough money to move out sure. yeah <laughs> you're like you don't understand grandma it's first last and security deposit <laughs> like so much we're not buying a house for 15k like you did <laughs> But I loved what I was doing, and I was working with Maroon 5 stylist Matt Goldman, who is uh, like taught me everything I know. I still tell him that to this day. Well, yeah, those um, boys always look great. Yeah, and so he taught me, and he's a costume designer, and he does commercial, and he like just taught me how like the whole span. And then he also dressed Adam for like red carpets, and I just kind of really loved like that aspect. And then I started working with Annie Saltiris, who she is a godsend she's like so kind and nice and like one of a kind in the industry and she dresses chris pratt and rob lowe and justin timberlake oh my and, god uh, i mean literally to all of them but yep yep but yep one where she it's her job i didn't really do anything and she was like the main stylist i was just there to like help return and just like help her second hand but she also has just taught me how to be a nice person in this industry because i think yeah that, a really tough like you can be nice in this industry everyone <laughs> you know right. you don't have like and so and then that's how i fell into menswear is you just kind of like build a reputation with the people and they trust you and so it is celebrity styling i think can go many ways either it's like you know a friend that gets you into it i know many different routes i feel like celebrity styling is like there's no one way road to being a celebrity styling but it's tough. It's a tough place to like kind of keep, you know, your foot in the door. I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> so, sure. Um, but I love it. I love like my clients. I love Ross. Ross and I met like probably three or three years ago, and this was like my first MTV Movie Awards with him. And yeah, like he's a just like such a kind human, and we just had fun putting this look together. It's a Couples shirt and. Yeah, he's really fun. He loves vintage, which I also love vintage. So that's really fun to have. And then, awesome. let's see, Esquire. This is Jay Alvarez. And we shot this in the pandemic, which like last year in June. Um, and it was shot in LA. And it was really tough to get clothes. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> it was like every those show. Those pants are pretty amazing, though. Those are Marnie. So like, at, of course was, they are. I'm pitter pattering. That's when it was um like Europe was open, but New York City and LA was shut down. So I had to get everything in from Europe. So like luckily they gave us like, you know, we had a lot of time to prep for it. And he's a delight. Jay's super really fun and a handsome man. So this was really yeah, fun. Yeah, for show. sure. <laughs> <laughs> and then Gavin, oh my God, I don't know what to say about Gavin. I just adore him. I think he's like really fun to dress because he's so creative like he's open to everything so like you like will bring a rack of clothing and he wants to try it all on which is just great that's for cool me. and like he's just you know this is actually like a lace shirt and it was clear and i was like are you sure you want to go down this route and he was like absolutely let's like button it he's the one that's like let's take it down a notch and like bring the sex appeal so he's so fun and creative he's really like involved in like what he wears i mean all the all my clients are pretty much like involved like but you definitely kind of bring your favorites and you already kind of know what you want to put them in especially in a red carpet you definitely like have your three favorites in the front sure, right like i know this is like a winner and then you have like a rack of like backups during your fitting but you know gavin is such a delight he's so fun to dress and i mean his career is only getting bigger and it's really fun to see everybody just like Bro, uh, no, it's pretty yeah. amazing to come in as someone is just breaking through, right? Like, yeah. I, I could just imagine like inheriting someone when they're like a little past their heyday and just <laughs> trying to like fight to keep oh, them yeah. relevant. Ray Romano, I love it. Okay, you brought him up, not me. So, okay. <laughs> I mean, because he's like, well, I guess I don't know if I can go into this, but anyways, he's really fun to dress because I think it's like really fun to like like bring in a suit that makes him look a little bit sharper. I think that's just yeah, really Yeah, for fun. sure, for sure. Yeah, I, I, I guess that's, that is the other side of the coin that I didn't think about. It's like if someone has kind of a, 
a history for being a C, if you can make them an A, that's pretty, that's pretty awesome. You feel really good after that red carpet. You're like, oh my gosh. <laughs> right? So much good accolades and things. That's yeah. awesome. So now I'm going to invite Ricardo and Leia to join us again. And because we've gone through 43 minutes of conversation, we're going to do um, the questions in a, in a lightning round. Leia's back. I know that she refilled her tequila. <laughs> you are muted though, my dear. Yes. Yes. Look, I'm running low. I have the big I'm ice cube too. Over. The big ice cubes. Yeah, yeah. So it's not oh. really four ounces, you guys. It's 1.5. Thanks. All right. <laughs> so um, I think I have 10 questions. We could get through them in, in 10 minutes and still have room for questions. What does the pathway look like today to becoming a professional stylist? What kind of education or internships are needed to really uh, get your foot in the door? I think that okay. you really attitude right? i don't know I attitude I, I i think it's and i hate to say this but i think it's who you know in the business to get your foot in the door and no different than me knocking on a trailer door you know making my face and name known and you know you, you got to bang on those doors and you, you know no is not no no is well, i'll try again but uh um, well, that's why i like your story so much leah where you were talking about how you began and you're like, I want to be a stylist. This is what I want to do. Where do I start? And there was already a job there for you. So right. you know, there was, you a, there was that person has like that, the guts exactly, to get like, in. Right. Like I didn't even know there was a job for me. I just knew that I was like not going to be shelving toys for the rest of my life at Bloomingdale. And that's a Dolly story too. Like she's like, I'm working in design, and you know, I think back in our day like being a fashion designer looked like the epitome of the industry and it looked glamorous and all of that, where of course it's totally not. And seeing somebody else like getting able to go and shoot and 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 display your clothing in a way that you really felt ownership to saying, all right, I'm going to pivot because that's really, it's the image that you care about. So yeah, and then I think Dolly talked a lot about finding mentors. Um, I don't know if Ricardo and Leia, if you had mentors in your career who, who led you along um, or, or kind of helped open doors, but I, you know, finding good I mean, people. Course, I did for sure. Um, Chayo Mata, she was a New York photographer and she really mentored me from A to Z and really took me into her, you know, under her wing and, and, and started me off as, as a photographer. So I met her in Dallas and then she moved to uh, New York City and started assisting Stephen Mizell. And so for oh, wow. her, it was you know, also this whirlwind of uh, photography. But then when she heard that I wanted to start shooting, she said, come come back to New York. I want you for a month. And I, I just assisted her. So yes, there are those beautiful people. Did you get paid for that month of assisting? No, of course not. No, yeah. I didn't. Okay. No. Yep. No, but that you know what to piggyback on that. There's going to be a lot of stuff you're going to do to put your time in and not get paid. And you're not getting paid, but your face is getting seen and your voice is getting heard. And that's really, really important. And as Dolly said to uh, to you know to comment on that, it's you do be nice and people will be nice back. It is a doggy doggy business. It's building but, reputation, and, and, building brand she, equity. Yeah. You a hundred percent, and you want to be that. You want to be that person, that human that that just does it because you do it. And then eventually, you're going to end up not giving any more fashion favors out, but and you want to be paid for them. But what you end up going to do is you're going to get your voice heard. And that was like I didn't really have a mentor because I didn't really know anyone back then who did that. And I became the trailblazer. And then I became the one to start training people and getting people into the business. And and then I was doing other shows as well as a ghost. I had a ghost name on air, you know, for my credits. I wasn't, you know, I was doing it to help people out. So you, you kind of have to like beg, borrow and steal to get what you want. And, and, and don't take no for an answer. I mean, and, and you, you, just so keep that going. It's crazy. Really easily into our next question, Leia. Like, what do you look for in an assistant or an intern? Or like, you know, e.g., like, what are the requisites that someone needs to have to for, for you guys to recognize talent and, and you know, take them under their, their wing, paid or unpaid? Sense of urgency. Somebody who always knows what sense of urgency is. They're always there. 
they're your do or die girl. You know, that's what you need to run a great business. And you also have to be able to run a great business. You also be able to trust them because if you can't delegate something for them to do, you don't need them. So you have to be able to build the trust and to have someone who is, has a sense of urgency. I look for that in everybody I hire. It's really, Absolutely. really important. Show up on time. Oh my gosh. I like show up on time and have like, be nice. I don't know. Cause it's a sense of urgency. I, because you have to realize too, when you're an intern and assisting, there's someone else right behind you. And I don't mean to say that in a bad way, but if you slack, then I just don't have time to teach you in that way because I'm not going to waste my right. time. You have you time know. to teach them in the way that you can teach them, but you don't right. have time to teach them how to be a basic uh, <laughs> contributor. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I it's the same that. for models. They, they always think that modeling is a fun thing. It's not a job. And until they realize it's a job, that's when they become a really successful model. What's you your know. advice to any aspiring models, Ricardo? Oh gosh. I mean, um, I mean, we right, we <laughs> have a whole panel about this. Give me two bullet points. Well, I think um I don't know. I think being nice in this industry is super important. And I love that you said that, uh, Dolly, because you know, we have such a bad rap in the fashion industry of being this sort of mean and ugly, and I guess it can be at times, but if I find a model that is not kind and respectful they don't last very long with me interesting um, that's you know, awesome it's just i can't do it and it's too much work and i there's too many of them to have it like one said, there's already there's always somebody behind them waiting to go always and they they have to know that i mean they're going to castings with 200 girls or you know whatever it is and you know the, it's just crazy for them but and then the other part is being respectful of the job. So on time, um, understand what their brings are, um, understand that everybody has to start somewhere and develop in, in order to become a good model and a good stylist and a good photographer. And there is that room, but as soon as you know that you have value and you respect that, I think that's what really gets, takes you into a, a, a much further career. You know, you have a longevity. Yeah, okay. so. Ricardo, you, in talking about your background, you have run the gamut from makeup to photography to model management. Um, in today's work as a fashion stylist, do you think it is important to be a jack of all trades, to know fashion, to know hair, to know beauty? Um, or can you, can you just focus on one area and still be successful? You absolutely can. I think, um, you know, I, was getting a bad rap from my friends in New York because they're like, hey, you're doing too much. And I said, well, gosh, you know, in San Antonio, you really have to be able to do, do other things than just makeup. It's just not going to be, you're not going to have a livelihood. And um, so for me, it it turned into that. And it was just things that naturally worked its way into it. And so I felt it was very organic and I was okay with it. But I do think that, you know, we, we need these two stylists that can tell us like what to wear. I wish I could afford you at all of my photo shoots so that you can be here and shoot with me. But, you know, budgets come into play and there's just so much that um, that goes into a job, right? And so we need that hair person. We need that makeup person. We need the stylist. We need the prop stylist. Uh, we need the assistants and the interns. And then, you know, somebody has to shoot it. So hopefully it's me and, um, you know, work is work and right now is is a difficult time so everything is is to me very valuable and i respect and and trust everyone that's on that set so that is that is, a fair assumption to say guys that like as you begin your career and if you're in maybe like a i don't want to call it a second tier market but maybe not one of the major markets having a breadth of knowledge can be very beneficial in getting in, in, in starting your career. And then as your career grows, you can become more of a specialist. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I, I always call myself the Jill of all trades. So, yeah, you, you know, so mm -hmm. there you go. I mean, to know a lot about something, you could become scrappy and get it done. And I always have this thing in the back of my head, what if my assistant, what if someone doesn't show up? I need to, or what if this person doesn't show up? You have to be able to know and how to pivot and get it done. 
So it, yeah. it's, I think it's really important to know every angle and to know what could happen if that doesn't, if some, if, if you, there's a no show. So, I've you know, you've got to figure out how to do things. I've had tailors not show up on set and I've had to like tailor the things for me. And I'm like so grateful for my design background or sewing background or like there are times to like spray paint a button because you can't find the right color, which I'm sure Leah, you know, like Sharpie. you just <laughs> Sharpie make things happen. Like, because it's like, sometimes you can't find it in the real world, but that's like, that's the, not a solution. Like if the client wants purple, on their coat like maybe bring purple fabric and have a tailor sew it on or sew it on yourself like you just have to get really like crafty and creative and and i mean even if you need to do makeup or hair sometimes because it's a small crew like mm -hmm. that's always a good thing too I, yeah and, and so also never say it? no to the personality like so never say no to the host the personality whoever you're working with if they want something you have to make it happen for them. Whether you disagree, but you'll give it your own flair, but just never say no to them because guess what? You say no, you're out. Right. So and it's a matter of if appeasing. If they want to see a look, you give them the look. And then if you, if you don't like it and you are, you know, if you stand with that opinion, you might be able to convince them that they don't like it also. Exactly. Or, you know, like the, let's the other minds at the minds like, yeah, no, that was a bad idea. Celebrity X. Let's move back to the original plan. But sure, you right. they have to, to see it. Right. They have to see that their idea is really bad, but you just have to execute it for them so they have this really horrible visual. So right. It's I've done that many times. Nice banks. And I think having a tough skin is really important for this industry as well, because just like you were saying, you know, never say no, let's make it happen. And they're gonna say, gosh, I really don't like this, or I really love this. And you have to be able to switch in in a second. You know, if they say like, oh, that button should be whatever color and you're going to spray paint it or you're going to paint it, like you have to have solutions. There has to be solutions. And that's what I really look for in an intern. If they can help find solutions and put out fires, then I know they're going to work well with me. And I like that's people that are fast. Ask. I don't like slow people. I like fast people because okay. we just don't have time. We're shooting. We have a catalog to shoot all day long. I mean, sometimes I'm shooting jewelry catalog and, you know, this tiny little earring is this big. I can't even see it, you know, so I'm, we need to have solutions for anything that comes up. So you would right? say as an intern or an assistant or something starting out, like, don't be shy with your opinion or if there's an ask, if there's a problem that you overhear, feel free to offer the opinion or, or that's an interesting balance, I guess, right? I'll let you guys answer that. <laughs> That's tough. I think that like I've had interns where I'm like love it when they jump in and they're excited to get there. But when there's like I think read the room because if there's like client around and models and talent and then they're like being really loud and like intro like I I I don't know. I couldn't handle so that. So think about it, have it in your head, and when your boss brings you the problem, then be there with the solution. Exactly. Yeah. Cause you do it in it. Right. The there, there's a level of decorum and professionalism that you don't want to like usurp your boss. And I, I mean, in my experience in many different fields, there have always been these people willing to step on their, their, their bosses or their, their, their I don't want to say superiors, but their bosses to get some credence for themselves, which is again not being nice, as we've all discussed being nice is paramount. So I'm going to invite the audience to enter any questions they have as we are like fastly approaching our uh, time. And while you guys do that, please do that audience, please ask some questions. Um, I will go through um, one more of this, you know, out of the five questions I have less, I think this is like the one I never figured out as I styled five times in my life. How do you source a wardrobe, especially when you are starting out in the business? Um, I believe in beg, borrow, and steal. So when I was doing it and my budget was very slim, I used to offer, I don't know, I, I, I think they still do it today. I used to offer on-screen logo credit um, to get free clothing. Um, and I also would look for emerging designers who needed exposure. 
so and and just just stay true to your own style though I, you know i i always had my own style and i always stayed true to it very tailored very clean and you know timeless and and i and i use that a lot in people i worked for and dressed uh, and you know and you get you get that you know loose cannon who wants you to put them in like skin tight shirts that don't fit but you know you get you get who you get and you got to make it work so i i say stay true to your style yeah i think i i used a lot of vintage and then emerging designers are really great i think new york is a plethora of them and especially with instagram there's so many like opportunities mm. to like go out and do collaborations or you know like i mean use your own closet use your friend's closet like and big borrow steel like that is just the stylist motto i mean you know favors and um, and then before you know it, you'll have like a whole stash and you're like, how did I become a hoarder? I don't know. Cause you just, <laughs> <laughs> no, right? but, um, I think yeah, just like, totally like work with your friends, collaborate and you really don't need much, like just a really great, like three looks for like your first test shoot. And I, I believe in definitely testing, working with people, collaborating, building your teams, um, finding those people that you really like. Because that's going to create your whole career too. Like you're going to keep going back to those people that you know you helped along the way. I think. Yeah. Interesting. Um, here's a question from the audience from Quinn H. How do you re recommend getting your foot in the door if you're not in one of the major fashion centers, i.e., New York or LA? For instance, if you're going to school in the Midwest or you know the Southwest or someplace where there's there's not a big fashion scene, but you still have a passion to do this. Instagram. Move. <laughs> Move. 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 New York, Laya. Let's let's bring this to Ricardo, who currently lives in San Antonio. Okay. I know your your career was established well before you moved back to San Antonio, but you know what would you give advice to a, a young kid from San Antonio? Let's say I've been mentoring at UIW for many years, and. And with the design students, I always suggest like save all your pennies and all your money, all your dollars and move to New York <laughs> because you have to work for someone. <laughs> and I, I mean, that's the bottom line. And it's terrific. I would love to have, I have interns all the time and we love what we do, but at some point you're going to need to go into a major market and figure it out. I'm able to do it because I was in New York for 18 years and then I was in Europe. And so now it's, it's okay. Some of my models actually come here and make more money here than they do in New York because there's, you right. know, so much competition for them there. Right. Smaller pond, right? Bigger fish. Dolly, it, it is. let it's, me ask you this. With your, I mean, you're on social media a lot. Do you think there's a room for a social media stylist, regardless of their location, to, to, it, it, could that be a place for people to start? I think that you do have to be in LA or New York. I think it is like definitely an in-person person thing. And you can do like virtual styling apps or like kind of like that world, but actually like to create a relationship with your clients, you need to be there. Like, and they want to see FaceTime. They want you to like walk through everything. It's very personal. I think styling is really a personal, especially a celebrity styling or even what Leah did you know, working really closely with them on set every day, you build a relationship with them and they trust you and that's super important. So I think virtually, yeah, I save up your pennies and, and move. <laughs> so we <laughs> just had to follow up. She said she's looking for- Yeah, there's a lot. I'm sorry. I, I was just wanted to say something. Pre-graduation, you know, you're in school for four years in this city. Like, and maybe she has that? plans to move. I don't know, but like it, you know, you're you're in that so area at this point in time. Like your own little fashion world, you know, like start a presence online because I think that will definitely like then give you credit when you're like, I have this little intern in Reno, Nevada, and she is so cute and so sweet, and like, but she started her own blog and she's super passionate, and then eventually she's moving to New York. So. Yeah, so it's test shoots, it's doing your own stuff and building a portfolio. But there's yeah. also like you could do a summer internship and you know a lot of people do summer internships and and finally they land the job after they graduate because they've been doing summer internships for four years. And those sure. are the go-getters. Those are the ones that are actually gonna 
make something of themselves because they've been putting in the time in their summer to go and do an internship somewhere. Yeah, um, I mean, we've certainly yeah. had these discussions about, you know, uh, disparities uh, in wealth and which allows one to go and take their summers off to, to do these things versus someone who has to work to pay their their tuition or their rent and things like that. But um, yeah, I mean, scholarship. It, it's a sacrifice, right? I actually won a scholarship in between my, like when we were in college at Pratt, I signed up for like scholarships, summer programs, like any kind of thing that I could like make a little extra money because I um, don't come from a wealthy family. And I went and interned at Roxy Quicksilver. That's how I got the job and interned there for the summer without paid. And then on the weekends, I was working at their stores in downtown, you know, like it's a hustle. Like if you really love it, it's a hustle. And I think yeah. also, it's just, you're going to have to be working seven days a week, like, you know, nonstop, mm -hmm. like three jobs, if you really love it. I don't know. That's what it takes. And that's, I mean, I think that's, that's exactly if you love something, right? It's not really, I mean, yes, it's work. We all know that, right? But it's, it's much easier to work 60 hour weeks when you really love what you're doing. Yeah, it's true. 80 hours passion, a week. Passion. 80 hours a week, even when you're getting paid well. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> well, I was going to say, they could even do an internship during Fashion Week. I mean, I, we do really large shows here for San Antonio Food Bank. We have 550 people come to the show, and it's a big show. We have, you know, 80, 80 looks. So we really need an intern that can help us bring in all the clothes make sure that they're in by scenes. You know, we have 20 models coming on and it's a lot of work to be backstage. And if you can learn how to do that, I mean, gosh, you can no, work I anywhere. Mean, I think I was 15 or 16. I'm from Seattle and Nordstrom was having a fashion show benefit. And I called mm -hmm. every name, every place that I could find. And I, they said, sure, you can come in and intern. And, you know, for the first part, I was dressing and putting things on racks. When I came down to this show, I was escorting people to their seats, but it was still like, it was still something. And Seattle is not known to be a fashion hub, but it felt like I was doing something. And um, yeah, so we have gone over our time. I think we could probably stay and talk for another hour. I think at least um, Ricardo, <laughs> next time you make your way to New York, we're all gonna have to meet up and like definitely have some tequila. And uh, with that, I bid you all adieu. I thank everyone for attending the Conversations on Dress Series by Costume Society of America. And please subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow us on social media to learn about the next episodes of the series. So thank you so much, you guys. Love you all. Good night. Thank you. Love you. Bye-bye.